In the book of Luke, we read about the most exciting event to ever happen in our world, the birth of Christ. Luke's gospel lays out a story filled with anticipation, intrigue, wonder, and hope-filled news for humankind. It was the day when God's great plan of salvation and redemption was irrevocably launched. And as we look to the cast of characters God gathered together, our eyes are open to a new response, focus, and growth in the Christmas season. As we look back in awe and wonder, for unto us a child is born. Merry Christmas. Good morning. Again, thank you for being here at Greenwoods this morning. A pastor shares, every Christmas morning my grandpa would share a funny story about his grandpa, and my brother and I knew this story inside and out. It became a tradition, really. It wasn't a great story by any means, but it didn't seem like Christmas if he didn't share the story. We'd gather around his chair in the midst of the torn up wrapping paper, bows and boxes, and he would tell us about going with his grandpa to his favorite restaurant in their hometown for his holiday breakfast. He'd say, Grandpa would always have eggs Benedict. Just before they would bring out his order, Grandpa would make a special request. He'd hand over the hubcap from his old Studebaker and say, would you mind serving my breakfast to me on this? The waitress always complied, interestingly, but one year she said, I just have to ask, why do you have me serve you Eggs Benedict on this hubcap every Christmas? Well, Grandpa said, there's no plate like chrome for the hollandaise. Jeez. Ah, nothing like corny Christmas traditions, right? In honor of Christmas t traditions in my house, we get to open up our stockings before church. So I'd just like to share some of the things. We, we gift each other sort of silly, fun things. Uh, like bacon, beef jerky goes with everything, so I'm very happy about this. Uh, too blessed to be stressed. A little sticker from my desk, probably. We'll see if this works. Um, I got these socks that have a, a snowman who's melting. Uh, he's apparently having a meltdown. That's what it. So those will be good too. I should have worn them today. And my favorite, I have an emergency clown nose. Because you never know. Um, never leave home without it. Use may impair wearer's ability to remain serious. If symptoms develop, continue use. It encourages so. I will not adorn this on my face because I have to maintain some semblance of dignity as your pastor. But those are just some of our crazy little corny traditions. Welcome to Greenwoods Community Church this Christmas morning. Merry Christmas. You know, in the midst of presents and family and friends and food and wrappings and trimmings, thank you for just taking a moment to pause from your own traditions and give thanks for Christ's presence. You know, I've always loved Christmas times and, and, and its traditions. I love the special meals. I love the season. I love the lights, the music, the carols in particular. Christmas Eve was always such an exciting time when I was a little kid. The anticipation grew to almost unbearable levels as Christmas Day approached. And like most kids, as I was growing up, if you asked me what Christmas was all about, you know, I would likely have said, it's about Jesus. But in my heart, I'd have been thinking presents, probably like this little one here. You know, no matter how hard I'd try, I couldn't make myself as a child feel excited, as excited about Jesus' birthday, you know, as I felt about ripping into those packages with my name on them under our Christmas tree. But as a kid, I really did want it to be about Jesus, but the presence had a pretty strong pull on my heart. I'm not sure if I should admit this to you, being the pastor and it being Christmas Day, but as I stand here, you know, I'm pretty excited to see what I'm getting for Christmas, as I imagine some of you are sitting in the pews there. I'm very excited. Honestly, I'm more excited to see how my family reacts with what Micheline and I got our family and, and our friends. So I know the power of food and, and presence. And in the midst of all this, 
Could, could I just ask all of us to take this short time we have together to just pause for a moment and focus on the greatest gift that has ever been given. Luke 2, 6-7 to presents this gift to us. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, we read. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Jesus' arrival into our world says so much, so much about who he is and how he operates in our lives. The gift first presented himself in a, in a way similar to the way he presents himself even to you right now, today. Quiet humility, boundless love. His parents had left their hometown of Nazareth to be registered for the census, and they couldn't find a place to stay, and it's a remarkable event every time you encounter it and read it. If you consider who Jesus is, because he is indeed the Almighty One, yes, the Alpha, the Omega, John Chapter 1, verse 3 says, through him all things were made. I mean, he has the ability to calm storms and still the waters, to peel back the heavens, to stop time, to thunder to the ends of the earth, yet there was no room for him when he arrived on earth. And then if you consider the way he was received, or really more accurately ignored by most, it speaks to so, so much about how we can respond to him, even at this moment, even now. The manner of his arrival reminds us that Jesus doesn't force himself upon us. He doesn't make threats. He he doesn't beg. He doesn't make a grand display. Instead, in his arrival that night, in his arrival now, he offers us quiet invitation. A call to be welcomed in, welcome home in the dark night of our own hearts. It's no coincidence that the inn was too crowded for him. How ironic that the one who came to welcome us back home to relationship with Father God spent his first night in a barn, lying in a feeding trough because no one had room to welcome him. The circumstances of his birth show us how people throughout the ages would misunderstand and reject him. More often, though, people simply wouldn't have room in their lives, and they would just end up ignoring this great gift, this great invitation that he extends to everyone, to all people. For the Advent season, we've been looking at the cast of characters in God's amazing arrival and rescue mission, the Christmas account. As we remember each cast member's response to Jesus' arrival, Can we just consider for a moment our response to the fact that Jesus has arrived right here, right now in this place? Uh, Jesus is right here wanting to be a greater part of your life, all our lives. He wants to become an important part of your life. And and if you've never responded to Jesus' invitation and arrival by giving your life to him, we, we will have an opportunity when we pray at the end of this sermon. Uh, Perhaps you can already sense him knocking at your door, at your heart's door. The prophets, the angels, the shepherds, and the magi all had an important part to play in his wonderful arrival. They all responded to Jesus in a unique and wonderful way. Let's just consider their responses briefly as we think about Jesus this Christmas day. Uh, This is the holiday we we remember that God took a huge step toward us. You know, we were in trouble, and and although we were created to be with him, our hearts turned far from him. And there was a barrier between us and our creator that had to be dealt with. If a couple thousand years of Jewish history teaches us anything, it's that the answer wasn't going to be found in any human effort, our own efforts. The resolve to try harder. God took a big step toward us by coming to live with us. Why? To show us the way and to remove that barrier through his death on the cross. It's not about being good. It's not about trying harder and earning God's favor. It's just about being near to God through Jesus. Simple. Emmanuel. God with us. Even his name paves the way for nearness to God. I know that some of us are here right now because it's expected or even required, right? Grandma said that everyone has to go to church, so here we are. 
If that's where you find yourself, that you'd rather just be done with all this religious stuff so we can get to get home and get on to the good stuff, I want you to know that I get it, and, and I'm really grateful and honored that you're here. And I know as a group, we Christians have given the world pretty much few good reasons to consider shutting out the Christmas story. I mean, this simple story of Christmas isn't about church or even about religion. It's about relationship. It's about love, life, freedom. And if you have questions or you're struggling with who Jesus is, just try to look beyond all that you've heard about Jesus for a moment. All the things that you've seen people do in the name of Jesus, good, bad, and even ugly. And try to find for yourself who Jesus is. Before you completely close the door to Jesus, just open up the Bible. Open up your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew. Read it straight through to the end of John's Gospel. Those Gospels, those accounts about Jesus' life. And all four Gospels are really just a little more than a hundred pages. They can be read in a sitting. Do that first, please. Don't shut the door on Jesus until you've taken a look for yourself at who he really is and what his birth really means, which then leads to other questions about who God is and what God wants and what your life, what your life could mean through his eyes and ultimately what eternity holds for you. Because friends, that's what Christmas really means for all of us. God had been talking about his arrival in the person of Jesus Christ for thousands of years before this wondrous event ever took place. Isn't it amazing to think that specific words and, and, and details were written about Jesus' birth and death and resurrection hundreds, even thousands of years before that these amazing events occurred? I mean, through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the prophets knew that we needed a Savior. And they spoke of His coming. And we can respond to Jesus by responding to Him and welcoming Him in our lives by eagerly and earnestly looking for and preparing Him in everything we do. That's what Advent is all about. Or what about the shepherds? You know, they saw the angels appear right before them. I mean, could you imagine a great heavenly choir splitting that night sky with light and music and hope? How would you have responded to that? Would you wonder what everyone else is pointing and staring at? Or... Do you feel like you're missing something? Like you don't have the inside track or inside knowledge about what's going on? I mean, I've been there. Uh, but friends, there is no special knowledge. The arrival of Jesus is personal to each and every one of us. You don't have to be anything you're not, praise God. You don't have to pretend to feel anything you don't. And that was a huge lesson for me in my early faith. So what's your response after witnessing the heavenly host, the shepherds didn't continue to stand there pointing at the sky. They said to each other, come on, let's go see this thing that has happened. You know, maybe some of us are a little curious. Maybe some of us are wondering if there really is anything to this story for us, or if it's just weird people pointing at nothing and staring around aimlessly. If that's you, may I ask you to just try responding to Jesus? Just engage the Christmas story a little more than you have in the past. And scripture tells us quite clearly, God is love. We've all seen God's greatness in the beauty of the world. Amen? We've all experienced His brilliance, His nobility on some level, maybe even in our own hearts. But at the same time, I think we all can see that there's something broken in our world. And at some level, maybe even something broken in us, in our own hearts. If that's you, can you allow for this great idea that the cross of Jesus shows us a great intersection of two important truths about God. First, God's justice demands holiness and payment for evil and sin. And then second, God's love and mercy provided the payment through the death of the Holy One, Jesus Christ. And that's not the end of the story then. Amen? God is reaching out to you right now in His eternal enduring love. Romans 2.4 says God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So if you're curious like the shepherds 
I want to encourage you that you can respond by opening your heart to Christmas and to allow in the possibility that the first Christmas was simply God's expression of love and kindness to you, to each one of us. God displayed his love by sending his son, Jesus, to remove judgment and guilt from your life, your life, my life, our lives. So knowing this, can any of us take a moment to respond to him right now, what we're really thinking and feeling? Uh, How about a simple prayer? God, thank you. I I really do want to know who you are. Please start showing me. That's a wonderful response. You know, God really cares about the pain and brokenness in your heart, in my heart, in all our hearts. You know, the pain and brokenness that maybe some of us are feeling even right now in these pews. He even cares about the pain and brokenness that we've caused to others. Why? Because he cares about you. He cares about all of us. He cares about me and you. He took a giant leap for you from heaven to earth on Christmas when he emptied himself. This is amazing. He emptied himself of his glory, birthed himself into our world as a mere mortal, a mere human man. And what does he want in response? All he wants is for you to take a step towards that invitation. Some of us here this morning are like the Magi who who were waiting and watching for God to move on their behalf. When they finally saw that star, that sign, they immediately traveled hundreds of miles from the east and said, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. So like the Magi, some of us are waiting expectantly for God to move in our lives. I've been there. With great faith, maybe we've come here this morning just like those magi, ready to worship him. You know, they brought the best of what they had, gold and spices and perfume. You may be wondering what gift we could possibly bring in response to God's amazing gift of Jesus Christ. Well, I want to encourage every single one of us that you are enough. You are enough. The whole reason Jesus came into the world, lived in this world, died and came back to life was so that he could be with you. The point of Christmas isn't really gifts as much as it is connection and belonging and restoration. What can you give God? Well, God is pleased to just have your heart and your affection and he longs to build a relationship with you. Your response is a gift more precious to God than gold, silver, frankincense, myrrh. If you're wondering what you could possibly give God this Christmas, how about giving him the gift of allowing him a little more space in your life, in your heart? How about responding to God by simply giving more of yourself than you did in the past to tell him thank you? And in that spirit of thanks, why not give him a little more time of devotion and space in our lives? When you do that, I promise that your gift will be met in a joyful, heavenly communion of God giving more of himself to you. And that cycle never ends. Because his connection, his closeness to you, that's all that God desires. That's all he wants. That's his Christmas list, friends. You. So whomever you most identify with this first Christmas, all of us can we can together close the service with the joy of the angels, right? On the night when Jesus arrived, the angels praised God and sang, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. We can wrap up this part of Christmas by carrying our praises out into our Christmas traditions and celebrations. We can give God glory in the way we treat each other. We can give him glory in the way we celebrate We can give God glory in the way we sing. We can give God glory in the way we live and the way we shine his light. Amen? For the truth is, when we're looking to anything other than Jesus for fulfillment, we're guaranteed disappointment. You can have the experience of a lifetime. You can go to a restaurant on the moon, but you'll still be disappointed. Have you heard about the restaurant on the moon, by the way? It's decent food, but apparently it lacks atmosphere. So... You see, even that disappoints, right? Wherever the wondrous and remarkable story of Christmas finds you, I'm so happy and thankful that you decided to share its remembrance with us here this morning. 
I'm honored that this special, holy, sacred time, you chose to be here for a moment. Thank you. Thank you. And now that it's finally here, I pray that your Christmas is calm. Are those two words even, can they go together? Calm and Christmas? Quiet, you know, full, and that it brings you one step closer to the one who came to dwell with us so that we can dwell with him forever. After all, that's his name, Emmanuel, God with us. Merry Christmas. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we declare, we proclaim that Christmas has come. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to those, to us, God. It's amazing on whom your favor rests. For the light now shines in the darkness, and the darkness, praise God, has not and will not overcome it. We want to respond to you, Lord, and your arrival by drawing closer to you. Please don't stop drawing near to us, for you are our everything. We praise you, Father, for coming to rescue us on Christmas, and we praise you for coming to rescue us today. We glorify you. We love you. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray. Merry Christmas. Father in heaven, angels, Holy Spirit, and Jesus, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, and the church said, Amen.